morning, friends. So this is the first in a new series really meant to supplement my practical courses that I've chosen to name Malware Development Foundations. These will be short, primarily theoretical explorations of foundational ideas to malware development. In today's lesson, we'll discuss what a process is. Well, there are many videos and articles on this topic, and so I'm going to do my absolute best to not just regurgitate them, but rather to present this to the extent that it's possible in a new way. And so in this quest, well, to introduce the idea of a process, I find it useful to use a familiar departure point. What is an application? Now, most of us have a clear idea of what an application is. Let's say Notepad or Chrome or Photoshop, etc. It's got a name and an icon and we can invoke it from the command line or we can run it by double clicking an icon and then there on our screen we have a GUI window. Now we can perform some specified actions with it. Perhaps we can save our work as a file to disk and then when we're done, we close it and poof, the application is gone. And so to us as a human, that makes a lot of sense. It's very clear. But the thing is, an application is an abstraction for us humans. So it makes perfect sense to us. But actually for computer, there is no such thing as an application. Instead, for a computer, the closest equivalent to an application is a process. Now, while there is overlap between an application and a process, they're not quite the same thing. And so then that still begins the question, what is a process? Well, sticking with our theme of departing from familiar ideas, let's once again consider an application. Let's just say Notepad. Well, here you can see my desktop and on the background we have this quote unquote application or more accurately a shortcut to it called Notepad. And so this Notepad is obviously code. Somewhere on my hard drive is a file with code, specifically instructions and then some predefined data. Now this file containing the instructions and predefined data is called an executable image in our computer lexicon. On. But right now, as we're just looking at it, it's really just an artifact. It's just sitting there on my hard drive, not doing anything. It just kind of exists. But now the moment I double click this executable image, this very same code will be loaded from my hard drive to my system's memory. And the reason for that is that my system now wants to run this code, but doing so from disk is too slow. And so rather it basically makes a copy of the file that will still exist on the hard drive and just load that into memory. And so now we have this executable image in memory and in a way this is the seed that will now become a process. But before it does, before we can call it a process, there are four other crucial components that needs to be added to the executable image. And now the first of these we've actually already discussed. It is actually the memory, but it's not the entire system's memory. Specifically, it's what we call the private virtual address space. So the executable image is already loaded into it, but there is more space because of course, as the program runs and we use different features, more space might be required. Now, without going into too much detail, I do think it's worth just quickly elaborating on what exactly is meant by private virtual address space. Well, the two operative words here are private and virtual. Well, it's virtual because it's an abstraction. The system creates this perfect continuous set of memory addresses starting from zero, but really the actual physical memory backing it can be anywhere in the system's RAM. In fact, some of it might not even be RAM. Some of it might be paged out onto the hard drive. But the thing is, from the processor's point of view, none of this matters. It receives this tidy little space of memory from zero to something, and it doesn't really care where that is actually being physically stored. That entire part is handled by the system. And then we call it private, and this just alludes to the fact, quite obviously, that this memory space is only for this process. So this actually points to a more fundamental and a critical abstraction in operating system design, process isolation. And the key thing that you need to know is, as with all design choices, there are, of course, trade-offs, but having each process possess its own little memory space offers two main benefits. Security, since it helps decrease the probability of other process being able to access the contents of this process's memory. And then also performance, because this process doesn't now need to quote unquote compete with other processes to grab a free memory address like some elaborate game of musical chairs. 
Okay, and so now we have our executable image, that is the predefined data and instructions. And we now have the space, the memory space in which things can happen. But at this moment, nothing is really happening because in order for instructions to actually execute, that is to go from the memory to the CPU and be processed, we require our third component, threads. Now you can simply think of a thread as a line or a pipe or even a thread of data moving from the memory to the CPU so that it can be executed. Now it's also worth knowing that each process can have multiple threads and in fact most modern software does. Here I'll open notepad in WinDBG, I'll run the tilde command and you can see that we actually have dozens of threads associated with it. Now it's also good to know that not all threads belonging to a process will be executing at the exact same time and threads can exist in a few different states. And finally, you should also know that each process has to have at least one thread. Now that single thread does not need to be running, but if the system detects that a process has zero threads, it will go ahead and kill and clean that process. Okay, so now we have threads and thus the ability to execute. But while the process executes, it will often want to interact with and refer to other objects, specifically other kernel objects such as threads, processes, files, etc. And to do so, the process needs something akin to an address book. Now, just like in your phone, you have a name associated with a telephone number. You will typically look up the name and then select that. But what is sent to the telecommunications network is not the name of the person, but instead the number of the person you're trying to contact. So the address books serves as a sort of index translating between a reference that is convenient to you and what is required by the telecommunications network. Now in the exact same way, if our process wants to reference another process, it can't just do so by name. For example, notepad.dxe. Instead, it needs to give the system what's called a handle which is a reference pointing to that specific process it wants to interact with. So for our purposes, just think of a handle as a unique identifier. It's something that the process can present to the system to essentially remove all ambiguity so that the process and the system both know exactly what is being referred to. But of course the process needs to be able to find this handle somewhere, just like we need a address book on our phone. And so this leads to our fourth component, which is known as a private handle table. So if a process wants to interact with a kernel object, then it can find the handle to that object inside its private handle table it can then present it to the system, which will allow it to make specific requests related to it. And so then that brings us to our fifth and final component that makes up a process, the security token, also called the primary access token. Now, any of us that have spent some time interacting with computers know, of course, about permissions. Some users are allowed to do some things, but not others. And of course, layer on top of this, group permissions and specific access conditions like working hours, etc. And this all means that at the level of the process, there are things it is and is not allowed to do. Because the thing is, the process will not restrict or police itself. The process might try to do anything, but that does not mean, of course, it will be allowed to do anything. And so it is the security token that contains the exact information about what the process is and is not allowed to do. But while the process might possess the security token, it does not actually ever use it because again, like we've alluded to earlier, a process manages, but it does not execute. It is of course threads that execute and thus threads that use primary access tokens. And so when a process spawns a thread, that thread immediately inherits the primary access token from its parent process. And then once the thread attempts to execute, that token will be verified to ensure the thread is indeed allowed to do what it is trying to do. And so one more thing worth knowing is that even as I just said, a thread will inherit the token from the process that spawned it. A thread may also use another token in what's known as impersonation, meaning the thread does not have to use the token that it inherited. And so for example, a thread can run with elevated privileges relative to the process that spawned it if it is somehow able to obtain a token with higher privileges. And so then to conclude, what is a process? Well, a process is these five things, the executable image in memory, the private virtual address space, the threads, the private handle table, 
and the primary access token but in a sense, it's also more than the sum of the parts. So you can think of a process as something that has these five things, plus the ability to manage them as a single integrated abstraction. Great, and so I hope this little lesson was useful. Until next time. Peace out.